Hello, Solar Eclipse Timer users. This is Dr. Telepin, and I want to discuss some information, new research, and conclusions about the change in ambient lighting at a solar eclipse. I am referring to that amazing point in time, just before totality, when you start to see your surroundings take on a grayish, silvery, or metallic tone. Let's talk about the Purkinje effect. <laughs> Second contact in four minutes observe changes in ambient lighting. One of the most fascinating partial phase phenomena during an eclipse happens within the last three or four minutes before totality. It's the weird change in the color of the surroundings that you perceive with your eyes. So why does this happen? It's not just dimming light. It's different than that because you are definitely perceiving a color change. I would explain it as a grayish or silver color filter effect, like looking through glasses with a gray color in the lenses. I've heard others describe it as a metallic look. But why? What's going on? Is it you? Is the color of sunlight changing? Is the character of sunlight changing? Or is it a combination of all of these things? In previous videos, I have discussed eclipse lighting changes in detail, and I will put the links to those videos in the description. I want to review some of those details quickly and then get to the new data I obtained at the 2019 solar eclipse and concentrate on color change and the Purkinje effect. The most obvious change, of course, is that the sun is getting covered by the moon, so the sunlight reaching the Earth has to be decreasing. In this animation of the lighting during an eclipse, the graph on the left is a measurement in lux with the meter pointed at the sun. The graph on the right is a measurement of sky brightness. This is data from others taken at the 2017 eclipse. In 2019, I measured the ambient light in lux at the observing site, not pointed at the sun. So this represents the lighting the way you would see it as you are enjoying the eclipse with your friends. It's your surrounding lighting. This graph does not return to normal light levels after totality because the sun set behind the mountains before C4. Through 90% of the partial phases, your eye brain system is compensating for the decreasing light. If you weren't aware that an eclipse was in progress, you would have no idea that the lux is decreasing this much. An eclipse is not like walking into a dark movie theater from the bright hallway and realizing you can't see well until you dark adapt. The initial response is your pupil dilating. The enlarging of the area lets more light in, but most of the work with dark adapting is in the biochemistry of your retina. The retina and your brain have an unbelievable range of light adaptation to continually adjust for the decreasing lighting and expose the surroundings for you. An eclipse is a perfect situation to demonstrate the function of the eye-brain system because the decrease in the brightness of light is so smooth and so slow. At an eclipse, the light is slowly decreasing over an hour and a half of time. The back of the retina is covered with two types of light sensing cells called cones and rods. The cone cells, of which we have about six to seven million, are the cells we use in bright light conditions and they need a lot of photons to work to send an impulse to our brains. They give us vision with fine detail and allow us to see color because there are three types of cones that absorb at three different wavelengths, blue, green, and red. This bright light vision is called photopic vision, and therefore, when you arrive at your observing site for the eclipse, these are the cells that are doing the work. The rod cells, of which we have about 90 million, are the cells that work in low light conditions. They are very sensitive to a small amount of photons, and their neural pathways are interconnected to help with low light vision. But this also means they do not help with fine vision. Rods absorb at one wavelength in the blue-green spectrum at about 498 nanometers, so they do not contribute to full color vision. They are night vision cells, and this type of vision is called scotopic vision. 
But things are not always very bright, photopic vision, or very dark, scotopic vision. There is an area in between which is called mesopic vision. This is the interesting zone of vision as it regards a solar eclipse. This is the key to understanding the change we see in the last few minutes before totality. You see, a total eclipse is the perfect situation to allow your eye brain system to make a very slow transition to nighttime vision, meaning it allows you to spend a significant amount of time, many minutes, in the mesopic zone of vision. In the mesopic zone, what is happening is this. It is getting dim enough that the cones responsible for color no longer have enough photons to fire off impulses as much. And the rods, which are designed to work in dim conditions, start firing off more impulses. So the decreasing output from the cones is decreasing your color saturation perception. So your surroundings become less colorful. And the rods, which basically send you black and white information, are firing more. So in the mesopic zone, what you see in your surroundings is less contrast in the red colors as they become darker and more bland due to less cone output. But you see an over-representation of the blue-green colors due to more rod output. This shift in the color spectrum you appreciate is the Purkinje effect. To most people at the eclipse, the Purkinje effect can explain why the surroundings get a grayish silver metallic cast. I want to mention that this effect cannot be reproduced with color camera sensors because they are not a biologic system that shifts its peak color sensitivity with the dimming light. However, the effect can be faked with a photo editing program. In this demonstration, I am simulating the Purkinje effect by decreasing the brightness, desaturating the reds, and adding a little bit of blue and green. Do you see how it makes the picture have a gray, silvery cast to it? Here are the two images side by side, the daylight balanced image on the left and the faked Purkinje image on the right. This is the effect you look for and what you try to appreciate in your surroundings at the eclipse. But I also wanted to study whether or not there's a contribution to our change in color perception due to the fact that very late in the eclipse, we are being illuminated only by the limb of the sun. It is well known that the limb of the sun is darker than the center, and the color temperature in Kelvin at the limb shows that it is more in the red spectrum. On a regular day, the color of the center of the sun overwhelms the contribution of the color from the limb of the sun. So only during an eclipse can we have a brief opportunity on Earth to be lit only by the limb of the sun. The question I wanted to study is can this possibly cause a real change in the spectrum of light reaching us and can it be documented during an eclipse? Also, does it possibly contribute to our gray silver color perception prior to totality. To try to answer these questions, prior to the last eclipse, the first experiment was to measure spectrum of the center of the sun versus the limb of the sun by myself in my backyard. I did this in my observatory using a standard glass solar filter on my telescope with a very high magnification, which creates a very small field of view. Using a spectrometer on an eyepiece, I could measure the spectrum of the center of the sun. Here's that graph. You see that all parts of the visible spectrum are pretty equally represented. I would move the telescope completely off the sun and then extremely slowly ease back towards the sun until I began getting readings again. With this technique, I knew I was now measuring the limb of the sun. This data is not standardized to a solar spectrum norm. The two measurements are only relative to each other, but they show something very interesting. The limb of the sun in my backyard experimental model showed a drop off in the blue spectrum. Here's the graph of the middle of the sun that I showed before. The spectrum is flat across the frequencies. Here's the graph from the limb of the sun. The graph from the limb of the sun shows a drop off in the blue spectrum. So the contribution of red on a percentage basis is greater. 
This confirms what is expected. We know that the limb of the sun measured in Kelvin is more red, and with my backyard experiment, I could demonstrate it. But does the same thing happen during an eclipse? When a very thin crescent is all that is illuminating the Earth, is the spectrum of light reaching us actually altered? So the question then becomes, during an eclipse, if a spectrum shift happens, when will it happen? Meaning how slim does the crescent need to be? And does the spectrum change happen gradually or abruptly? So my plan was to go to the 2019 eclipse with an easy to use spectrometer that I could point at the sun and record color data. The perfect device was this inexpensive Pasco light meter. It logs data in the red, blue, and green spectrum, as well as ambient white light. I mounted this meter pointed towards the sun on top of a video camera that was on a tracking mount tracking the sun. I began logging data measurements every second, starting just before first contact. The results are fascinating. When I looked at the raw data from first contact to second contact, the percent contribution of blue, green, and red were perfectly steady right until the end. Nothing changed until two minutes before totality. At two minutes before second contact, there was an abrupt change. The blue spectrum trended down smoothly. The green spectrum bumped upward for a few seconds before it trended down with the blue. And the red spectrum trended up smoothly. This eclipse data correlated with what I measured in my observatory. It reveals that the limb of the sun, when it is isolated, does indeed illuminate the Earth with a different spectrum of light. So in the last two minutes before totality, some of the odd colors we perceive may be due to the fact that we are bathed in an altered spectrum of light. If this altered ambient spectrum affects our color perception, then these perception changes would be combined with the Purkinje effect. But let me explain why having these two things occur at the same time is complicated. The red spectrum is contributing with an increasing percentage, but it is right at a time when the cones that sense red are functioning less due to the dimming light. So this increased perception of red spectrum probably doesn't help us see red because the dimming of light is the more important factor with shutting down the red cone contribution to vision. The blue-green spectrum is decreasing in percentage right at a time when more rods are beginning to work and they are more sensitive to these wavelengths. So the rods are getting less of their optimal wavelengths right at a time where they are trying to work harder due to the dimming light. It's unknown how this spectrum shift may affect rod recruitment at the time of dimming light. And overall, the lux is decreasing very rapidly. So this is an extremely dynamic two minutes. At an eclipse, it is very hard to comprehend all of the subtle changes in light. Because remember, this is also a very exciting time regarding eclipse photography and observing for shadow bands and everything else that requires your attention. When this is put on a graph, you can appreciate how interesting this is. Roughly, greater than 95% of the lux value has decreased before you even begin to get a Purkinje effect. And that is if you generously say that the Purkinje effect may become visible at five minutes before second contact. Then in the last two minutes, the actual light spectrum reaching Earth changes. These factors create this crazy color effect that it is an amazing thing to witness at an eclipse. I hope this information will help you learn to concentrate on it more and at the right time. There is one other thing that I noticed about the Purkinje effect between witnessing the 2017 and the 2019 eclipse. The 2017 eclipse was in the summer, and I was located on a green field with a lot of people wearing bright summer colors. I perceived the Purkinje effect very distinctly at this eclipse, more than any other eclipse I have been to. In 2019, the eclipse was in the winter on a dry brown field with no green vegetation, and people were wearing more bland winter colors. I did not perceive the Purkinje effect as distinctly in 2019. 
This made me realize that the colors in your surroundings at your observing site are important if you are going to see the effect. So every eclipse observation site will be different. You will need to have the proper target colors. You need to have a lot of bright, vibrant colors, especially reds and greens. So after this realization, I have a new recommendation for people who are arranging to see an eclipse with a group of friends. Before the eclipse, make plans with your group to have everyone wear alternating shirts of various shades of red and green. This way, you will have a lot of people around you that you can look at with the proper target colors for the Purkinje effect to be witnessed. Thank you for watching this Solar Eclipse Timer episode. I hope you learned something about lighting and ambient color during solar eclipses. My goal is to make this YouTube channel the absolute best place for people to prepare for upcoming eclipses. So download my app and plan to get to the path of the next solar eclipse. It's a wonderful thing to witness. Please subscribe by clicking the subscribe button below and also click the little bell that pops up. Then you will be notified when I release new episodes about solar eclipses. Post comments and questions. Thanks again. I appreciate your time.